Hello and a very warm welcome from Metal Headquarters here in Innsbruck, Austria. My name is Peter Clementi and I have the honor to be the moderator of today's surgery online session. Today we're going to be looking at a cochlear implantation in a five-year-old girl. Um, but before we start, I would just like to, as usual, go through our housekeeping slide and some participant tips. If not done so already, we would like to ask you to maybe change your name here in Zoom to your actual name, organization, and maybe even the country that you're joining us from. This can be done by right-clicking on your name and using the rename function. Um, like it says here on the slide, to avoid any background noise on your side, if you would please mute your microphone if you do not speak, and also please mute your phone. For a stable internet connection and also for a very pleasurable experience we hope we can give you uh, we would recommend to close all your applications on your computer or on the device that you're joining us from and as always at any stage all your comments and your questions are very much welcome like i said today we're going to be talking about a pediatric case a five-year-old girl implanted with a cochlear implant and it is my pleasure to also welcome our speaker dr markus wild he's an otolaryngologist and cochlear implant surgeon from munich from the klinikum rechts der isa and he has four plus years experience in cochlear implantation Although the department mostly performs cochlear implantation in adults, it's about 80%, I was told, um, he will be presenting a implantation of mentioned five-year-old girl today. And well, without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Wild and hand over the stage to him. Good day. Good day. Well, thank you very much. Let me just share the screen with you. So thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure for me to show you, show you this case of a pediatric cochlear implantation. But before I give you some more background information on the case, I would like to tell you where I'm located at. I'm sitting right now at Klinikum Rechts der Isar, which is part of the Technical University in Munich. And we are having a dedicated hearing center, which is part of the ENT clinic. And I'm just showing you the physicians where you have course, audiologists, speech and language therapists and engineers at the hearing center. And the hearing center is dedicated, of course, to the treatment of all kinds of hearing disorders, including CIs and implantable hearing aids. But it's also the link to the Technical University in Munich, which is especially strong in the engineering specialities and so also research is going on. But it's also a place for the patients to meet. We have a self help groups meeting there. We have several events. And one event that I in particular like is called Cochlear Plant Meets Classic. And it is an event where young musicians are playing for CE users. It is in collaboration with the Live Music Now organization, which was founded by Yehudi Menuhin. And I really like this monthly event because I like to listen to the music, but it's also very enjoyable to see that the CE users are also like to listen um, to the classic music. So with that being said, I would like to give you some background information and introduce the case to you. It's about a five-year-old girl with a bilateral sensory neural hearing loss basically since birth. She has hearing aids since her first year of age and she has a progressive hearing loss. Um, her hearing aids were insufficient for speech perception and that's why she came this year for the first time to our center to ask for a cochlear implant. She had new hearing aids, which were introduced two years ago and also fitted for several times, but um, in the kindergarten, and she's a, at a special kindergarten um, for hearing impaired children. Um, the caregivers told us that the speech perception was insufficient with um, the hearing aids. She is a carrier for pendulum syndrome. Both parents are single-sided CE users and the genetic testing did not re reveal any other cause for the hearing impairment. So how did the hearing look like? Looking at the Puton autogram, you can see that the left side is worse. She has a Puton average of lower than 90 decibels and the functional gain on the left side lies um, below 45 decibels except of 250 hertz. 
And looking at the speech audiometry, you can see that on the right side at 65 decibels, she can understand 60%. Um, and on the left side, 80%. Um, but at 80 uh, decibels on the right side, she can understand 70%. But on the left side, it decreases. So it's only 40%. And in a um, CE case, in a child, we're looking um, at the function gain, but also the computer and average. As you know, the speech audiometry changes, the tests change um, with age. So if you would be older and um, with this um, hearing, we would test with an adult test, then I'm sure she would um, score less or would understand less on the speech audiometry. But it's also important to look how the hearing um, evolved over time. And she has a progressive hearing loss. You can see this. Um, looking at the ABR in 2018, which was a lot better, which is called here um, DERA, and also the function gain in free fields with hearing aids on both sides was, was in 2018 a lot better. And she, then she had a, a progressive hearing loss. Uh, looking at the 2021 audiogram, you can see that her hearing deteriorated. Um, you're seen on the right side. Um, more than on the left side. And as, as I've shown you before, in 2022, you're hearing further deteriorated. And we could also see this looking at the DPOIE audiogram in 2018. There could be still a threshold estimated, calculated. Um, and in 2022, there was no function of the external. Um, ear cells anymore, so the um, cochlear amplifier is not working anymore. And also the ABRs in 2022 showed no more detectable responses on both sides. That's why we offered a cochlear implantation on the left side and to the patients and we performed some further imaging and um, she had an unremarkable CT scan she has a well pneumatized mastoid on both sides, no malformation, no, no enlarged vestibular aqueduct that could be seen. And also looking at the MRI scan at the cis sequence, you can see that the cochlea is fluid filled and there was a normal cochlear nerve and also no malformations shown in, on the MRI scan. So we calculated the cochlear duct length using the Autoplan software and it was 35 millimeters long to then design or choose the electrode and we chose a flex 28 electrode because it matched well the estimated frequencies um, in the cochlea. And I would like to now switch over to the video of the surgery. So I'm performing here a standard auricular incision in the shadow of the pinna, and I'm sizing the muscle periost to do the pelvic flap. And I'm also already preparing the tight superiostal pocket for the implant. Then I'm beginning with the cortical mastectomy in standard fashion with the spine of Henley and also the temporal line slant marks. And I'm collecting bone dust for later coverage of the implant bed and I'm trying to perform an overhanging mastodectomy so the, that the electrode lead is um, secured better. And the landmarks here are again the Techman, then the sigmoid sinus, and also the lateral semicircular canal, which will, will be seen just shortly. So 
removing the current septum here. Now you can see the natural semicircular canal and now I'm looking for the short process of the incus. I switch to a smaller cutting diamond burr, which I like very much because it's very controlled drilling, but also it's efficient. I like to remove the last bit with a cross thread. Now with the landmarks of the lateral semicircular canal and also the short process of the incus, I'm going over to the posterior to the anatomy. There was enough space in this case. You can see the cord at Tibonai, which is my anterior border, and it's still covered by bone. In this case, there was enough space because it's well pneumatized, so it didn't need to come close to the facial nerve. I'm using a lot of irrigation here, so there's no heat being built up. Then I try to expose the Hence the tuponi, tendon, and also the um, stapes. Now there's a little bit of mucosa in front of the round window niche. Now you can see the round window membrane, and I'm drilling away the balcony of the round window niche. I'm using a reduced speed, about 5,000 to 10,000 revolutions to be as atraumatic as possible. Now once the round window membrane is exposed sufficiently, I'll put some cotton there, which is soaked in prednisolone. Now I'm drilling the implant bed, or it's rather say it, an implant ramp. I'm marking the borders with a pencil or I'm drilling with a small drill. I like to build a, a channel. I don't like to build the tunnel anymore, which I used to do before. So then I need to funnel the electrode through and there can be some bone dust. On the, on the electrode. Now I inserted the implant and I'm opening the round window membrane in an anterior inferior direction to not injure base of the membrane. Now I'm switching to the lowest magnification. I like to grasp the electrode with the angled watchmaker's forceps. Um, I'm orienting the electrode towards the modulus. And I think this small dot is very helpful for this. And I'm very slowly inserting the electrode. The angle could be a bit steeper to be more lateral ball and to be more atraumatic. Um, this video is now more than two and a half times faster than the actual insertion. So I'm, I'm being quite slow here. If I need to grasp again, then I'm always securing the electrode with another forceps. You can see still then there's a small movement of the electrode. I try to correct this. And then I am inserting slowly the electrode further until it's fully inserted. I'm placing the extra lead behind the overhang of the master cavity. And again, they are securing the electrode that there's no 
movement of the electrode inside of the cochlea. I'm sealing the cochlea or the round window opening with connective tissue. Finally, I'm covering up the implant with the collected bone putty and also the channel. <clears throat> In my view, the implant that could have been a bit further away from the massive cavity, but I was drilling with a microscope, which makes it more difficult to drill under under the skin. I'm also covering the mastoid in the lower part at the mastoid tip, but I'm trying to not cover up the actual electrode, to not touch the electrode with the bone putty in case the electrode needs to be removed at any later stage. Then I'm suturing the musculoperiosal lab. And in children, it's particularly important to use small and fast absorbing sutures, like five or six mole micro rapid. You can also readapt the posterior auricular muscle if it's prominent. Then I'm performing the subcutaneous suture. I'm not performing a skin suture anymore in children. I use glue, which makes the life more easy for the patients, the parents, but also um, for me. Uh, this is the glue, it works well if it's fine. We perform the telemetry parallel to the implantation, and also we are measuring the e caps. And we ask the patient to send us pictures after they are discharged on a weekly basis um, so we can control the wound. And um, the patient was now activated. Um, for the first time, um, we do this three to four weeks post-operatively, and um, that's why the functional gain is still quite low. Um, fortunately, she only lost a little bit of the hearing, and uh, as you can see on the post-op audiogram compared to the pre-op audiogram. And with that being said, I thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Good. Thank you very much, Dr. Wirth. That was a very nice and interesting case and a, a very beautiful video of the implantation. Um, well, at this stage, I would also like to ask our viewers if there's any questions that you would like to post to Dr. Wirth and maybe start a little fruitful discussion. So we just want to want to give you um, a moment to type. We've also seen that a few of our viewers mentioned that the audio quality was a little bit distorted. Um, yeah, we, we are very sorry about this. Um, it, it's hard to change anything on our side here. 
everything sounded nice and, and crisp, but maybe it also might depend on the device that you're using. Um, but either which way. Um, so before we before we we might receive any questions from the audience, I would like to I would like to pose the question to Dr. Wood. Um, this is mainly about the one of the first slides where you showed the CT and the MRI scans, um, because we we were on the phone yesterday. Uh, I have to uh, admit, um, we had a little discussion if CT scans are actually still the go to, or if an MRI scan in certain cases would actually be, be sufficient. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we are still um, using CT and MRI scans, but I would like to um, move on and only um, use MRI scans, um, especially in cases where there's no malformation being um, suspected and where there's a normal external um, ear channel um, where I don't need the information if there is any abnormal or malformation formed facial um, nerve course. So I think um, it's possible to only um, use the MRIs and um, also other centers um, are, are doing this. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. And also regarding MRI, I, um, uh, I was just looking up the Penrith syndrome and I did learn that there is cases, or maybe it's very common, that there will um, be a, a thyroid condition additionally, which you might um, have to, over time, of course, observe uh, through MRIs as well. Well, she was just a carrier for pantron syndrome. So her father has pantron syndrome. So she has one LL, which is functioning. Um, so for the thyroid, we would use, we would use an ultrasound to check and not uh, MRI scans. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, um, I just see that we do have a question here in in the chat. Um, first of all, uh, um, Mr. Christopher Rain uh, says from the UK says lovely presentation, which I I also want to, to add my lovely presentation to you. Um, the question would be, do you do any post um, of radiology to review the electro positioning and are is uh, a patient's day case? I would assume this means like a like a, a day procedure. Yes, thank you for the questions and thank you also for the comment. Uh, we do uh, in, in um, periodic cases to reduce the um, amount of um, ionized radiation, um, a, a plain X-ray. Um, and um, in adults, we are also performing MCT scans to look um, for the electrode position. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, also, another question from my side, if I may. Uh, the implantation being performed at uh, the age of five is, um, of course, due to a, a hearing loss that, that just, like, of course, came over time instead of, like, being, of course, um, uh, pre, um, pre-lingual death. So, is there was there a discussion to maybe implant earlier? And maybe did it also have an... Um, some some sort of a decision making on the electrode choice. Um, also, thank you again for the questions. But I would like to also answer the question before um, we um, it, we are not performing it on a day case uh, basis um, in Germany. Um, so they are um, at the hospital for usually three days. Um, so to answer that question and. Um, the other question, uh, I mean, I think this is difficult in a progressive hearing loss. As you could see in this case, um, she had a um, hearing which was um, able to be amplified with hearing aids um, early on. So I think this was exactly the right choice to go to. Um, then in 2022, she presented the first time to us looking at the Putin um, average and also at the functional gain, I think on the left side, um, it's, it's clear to do a, or it's, it's um, the right time to do the implantation. But um, earlier on, the hearing was still better. And um, I think this is something that you need to discuss with the patients and or the parents um, when to perform um, the implantation and what are the odds of um, still waiting with the hearing aids and um, um, proceeding with a proper implantation. So I think in this case, um, I think it was the right timing, but um, if the hearing is um, progressing at an earlier age, then I would perform the CI earlier in, in such a case. And I think it's, it's important to monitor 
in, in a case of progressive hearing loss, be hearing closely. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, and I think that there is another question from Mr. and Mrs. Um, Doreen Bain. And this, I might, I might think this is going to be connected to the progressive hearing loss and to potential residual hearing. Question would be how much of the electrode is inserted into the cochlear for this client? Mm -hmm. It was fully inserted. Yeah, I could show you also the x ray, but it was fully inserted. Um, yeah, so all electrodes inside. The cochlear duct length was uh, 35 millimeters long. So, um, I, in my feeling, it's an underestimation with the um, cochlear duct length measurements. Um, usually, um, it's, in my view, a bit, a bit larger, but um, you could also discuss if you, in such a case, are inserting a flex soft with 31 millimeters, but I think this is um, yeah, rather academic because it's only three millimeters um, difference. The um, flex 20H, is maybe a little bit more atraumatic, which is um, important for the hearing preservation. But as the hearing is um, getting worse over time, um, you could also argue that it's um, important to have the full coverage or the longest electrode possible. But I think it's only three millimeters, so it's um, not a not such an important um, detail here. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, um, that would be all the questions uh, that we received and also from my side. I would thank you again so much for the lovely presentation and uh, the video. Really enjoyed that. I hope our viewers did too. Um, and well, thank you so much. And at this stage, I would like to come to an end of our, of our session. Um, apologies, apologies, sorry. There's one more question that just came in, uh, also from uh, Miss Mrs. Bain. Uh, will she, so the patient, uh, get another cochlear implant performed in the future? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Bilateral probably, patient. Probably just uh, a matter of time. And um, I didn't tell you, we just activated her. Um, this was the first case I could film after Meta asked me to, to uh, present um, a case. So I don't have further data um, after three or six months, but she already um, said that um, she um, had a good benefit of the um, cochlear implant. Um, compared to the hearing aid before, and she was very happy. So I think, yeah, uh, we will implant also the other side in the future. Yeah, that would be very great. And I think that would also be a very interesting case for a future surgery online, if we may ask you to do that and also follow up on this very uh, same girl. Great. Good. Okay. Thank you again very much. Um, and yeah, I think with this, uh, we would like to conclude today's surgery online session. Uh, and I would just like to, yeah, make a a little announcement for the upcoming surgery online, which is going to happen in a month's time from now, to be specific, uh, specific on the 20th of July. It's going to be an experience exchange about ossicular chain reconstruction and stapes surgery with self-retaining prosthesis by Professor Joachim Honung. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wilt. Uh, thank you for the great session. Thank you for the presentation. And also thank you to my team in the background that works very hard for this to be a very pleasurable experience. From my side also, everyone have a nice day or evening from wherever you're joining us. And I hope to see you guys very soon. Goodbye.